The United States Department of Health and Human Services has officially recommended that cannabis be moved from a Schedule 1 drug to a Schedule 3 drug in the most historic ruling in my lifetime regarding cannabis. But it did nothing, literally. So how can it be historic in one hand and do nothing in the other? Is this what everybody wanted? Are people upset? Where do we go from here? Is this good for business? What do we do? Let's get into the details and talk about it. In an article from Marijuana Moment, it says the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is officially recommending that marijuana be moved from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3 under federal law. A historic development that means the top health agency no longer considers cannabis to be a drug with high abuse potential and no medical value, which it did in the past. That's what Schedule 1 is. After completing a scientific review into cannabis under a directive from President Biden last year, the HHS is now telling the DEA that it believes marijuana should be placed in Schedule 3 of the Controlled Substances Act. The recommendation is not binding, and the DEA has the final say, but the scientific analysis combined with growing political support for cannabis reform may well influence the DEA to make change. Now, I just want to note the DEA stands for Drug Enforcement Agency. Laws are made in Congress. The CSA, the Controlled Substances Act, was passed in Congress and signed by the president. So all of this could be irrelevant if Congress passed a law that actually made it legal. But let's keep going. As a Schedule Three drug, cannabis would still remain federally prohibited. However, the rescheduling would have major implications for researchers who've long criticized the Schedule One classification that creates significant barriers to access for studies. Moving cannabis to Schedule Three would also unlock marijuana industry tax opportunities that are currently unavailable. We can confirm the DEA received a letter from the Department of Health and Human Services providing its findings and recommendation on marijuana scheduling, pursuant to President Biden's request for a review, said a DEA spokesperson. As part of this process, HHS conducted a scientific and medical evaluation for consideration by the DEA. DEA has the final authority to schedule or reschedule a drug under the CSA. DEA will now initiate its review. Again, I can't stress enough that the DEA is an enforcement agency. So this is actually showing you who has the real power in our government in America. Laws have to be approved by the DEA, but yet it's scientific and data. So how would it make sense for an enforcement agency, cops, essentially, to determine what is legal for you. They're enforcers. But as soon as that makes sense to you, let me know, and then it'll make sense to me. The FDA under HHS led the scientific review that led to Schedule 3 recommendation. According to Bloomberg, that first reported the development, and we'll get into that article here in a minute, HHS Assistant Secretary for Health, Rachel Levine, who advocated for medical cannabis as Pennsylvania's health secretary before joining the Biden admin, sent a letter to DEA on Tuesday about the Schedule 3 recommendation that referenced the review. The development comes two months after HHS secretary told Marijuana Moment that his agency was aiming to wrap up the review by the end of the year. Well, they did that. Congratulations. You're technically ahead of schedule. A White House spokesperson told Marijuana Moment on Wednesday that the administrative process is an independent process led by HHS and DOJ and guided by the evidence. So President's team will not be commenting on the agency's recommendation at this time. Why they don't recommend it or make a comment on it doesn't make sense because he could simply say, hey, we trust the science because didn't we say that for a couple years about something pretty big and they just... So, so as soon as you have the science in your hand, you would think that you would repeat the science. But maybe you don't really want to talk about this science since it's good for everybody and not you. There would be both political and practical implications of a Schedule Three reclassification if the DEA goes along with the recommendation. They could very well say no, and then all of this would be for nothing. I doubt that will happen, but we'll see. For researchers, this would mean that they would no longer need to go through the onerous registration process with the DEA in order to access cannabis for studies as a Schedule One drug. National Institute on Drug Abuse Director Nora Volkow, I think that's how you say it, sorry if I mispronounced it, 
has been vocal about the issue, saying at one point that she herself avoids researching Schedule One substances due to the barriers. Bloomberg reported that NIDA signed off on the HHS marijuana rescheduling recommendation. So you have a top health official saying that she doesn't really re request money for scientific processes and reviews because it's so hard to get the money and you have to jump through so many hoops and go through so many bureaucratic barriers to get approved. And they probably intentionally drag their feet like they've been and intentionally probably don't approve you if you're trying to study cannabis. Now, just as an aside, fun fact, the only place in the country and in the world you can study federally legal cannabis in the United States is at a place you may not know, it's Ole Miss. Ole Miss University, up until recently, has had the exclusive rights to study cannabis. Now, make that make sense. Down in the Deep South, how did they get that? Who knows? Maybe they know someone. So say you give a permit to Ole Miss to study cannabis at a very slow rate and the evidence that comes out is controlled by you whenever you want to put it out. It sounds a little conspiratorial, but if you know anything about cannabis, you know it's truly a conspiracy to keep it illegal. For the industry, the reclassification would allow them to make federal tax deductions that are currently prohibited for businesses involved in the scale of Schedule One or Two drugs. Because of this, the cannabis industry has faced a significantly higher effective tax rate and state governments have taken it upon themselves to provide state-level tax relief for their regulated markets. Politically moving marijuana from Schedule 1 to 3 would allow the president to say that he's helped accomplish a major reform, facilitating an administrative review that may result in rescheduling more than 50 years after cannabis was placed in the most restrictive category as the federal government launched a war on drugs. Now, the irony of this is that Joe Biden braggadociously says he wrote the crime bill, which put a lot of minorities in jail for nonviolent marijuana crimes. And now he wants to take credit for doing the bare bones minimum, which he hasn't even officially done anything yet. He wants to do the bare bones minimum and say he ended the war on drugs. That probably isn't going to fly with most people, especially me. One of the huge benefits of it going from schedule one to three when you unlock banking, you're going to have a flow of cash going into the banks. It's all cash. So as soon as they open up the banking, cash goes in. They administer grants for research and development and scientific processes. There you go. Money's moving around. Let's keep going. This could also bolster momentum for congressional efforts to further reform federal cannabis laws. As lawmakers come back from the August recess, crazy they've been on recess and vacation this entire month. That's a different story. And they try to pass cannabis banking legislation, they'll be able to point to the HHS recommendation as evidence of the urgency to normalize the industry. Again, it's a recommendation. It doesn't do anything yet because the DEA, who they say has the authority, probably hasn't even opened the email yet. So, they opened a comment period about a year ago about recommending rescheduling cannabis from one to three. They opened an administrative review. The reason why this is important is because they already have the evidence. They don't need a review. And I'll show you why in a minute. But let's get through this article. Advocates' highest hopes for the HHS review was that it would lead to a descheduling recommendation where it would be completely moved from the CSA and treated the same as alcohol in the eyes of the government, not rescheduled. There's a difference between rescheduling and descheduling. Some have also voiced the concerns that a Schedule Three reclassification could negatively impact state markets, with FDA potentially assuming a more hands-on role with respect to cannabis. However, a former top FDA official who chaired the agency's marijuana working group predicted that HHS would make a Schedule Three recommendation that he doesn't believe that reclassification would cause FDA to approach marijuana any differently than it does today. Acknowledging that many stakeholders and advocates would rather see complete descheduling, I'm with that, the former FDA official Howard Sklamberg pointed out that the agency and the Justice Department have taken a hands-off approach to the legalization movement while cannabis is considered a Schedule I drug. 
It, quote, defies logic to think that agencies would suddenly enforce criminalization if it moves to a less restrictive category. Again, the DEA is an enforcement agency. Cops are enforcers. They don't make the laws. They enforce the laws. So what do you do when you don't want to make the decision and you know you kind of ultimately don't have the power to make that decision? You say, ask them. Like if you're in high school or elementary school or middle school and you don't really want to do something with a kid who asks you to hang out, you say, oh, my, my parents won't let me. I'm so sorry. You know, I can't go out or I'm grounded. You, know, you kind of make something up. You blame it on them. Or if you try to schedule a day off and you, you don't, somebody asks you to do something, and you don't really want to do it. You just say, oh, I can't get the time off. You kind of punt it to the person who is the bad guy, right? So that's what Congress and all of these officials are doing. They're pointing to the person or policymakers or bureaucrats or whoever it is that actually have the power, the DEA. Let's keep going. Last week, Representative Matt Gates pressed the DEA admin to expand on her recent remarks about the origin and timeline of the president's marijuana scheduling review directive. Specifically, he asked for a copy of a letter that said the president sent to the attorney general and HHS secretary last year directing the review. He also wants an update on whether the administrator asked HHS about the timetable for their work, as she told him she'd do during a recent judiciary hearing. As far as the alleged letter from Biden is concerned, an attorney filed a FOIA, which is a Freedom of Information Act request, in an effort to obtain a copy. But earlier this month, the department said it had, quote, no records of such a document. So they're saying, we sent it to you. We sent you the document. And he's saying, where is it? I don't have it. I asked for it. You don't have it. Would almost imply they didn't send it. Or maybe they sent it to a different, maybe a personal email. Who knows? Maybe it went to the wrong email. Who knows? So all of these updates are going to be very important. But like I said, they want to follow the evidence and the science. And here's why that's very interesting. Because in 2020, the United Nations, more specifically the World Health Organization, through the United Nations, already reclassified cannabis. Already did it. They didn't recommend to do it. They already did it. In December of 2020, reviewing a series of World Health Organization recommendations on cannabis and its derivatives, the Commission on Narcotic Drugs zeroed in on the decision to remove cannabis from Schedule 4 of the 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs, which we will get into at a later date. People probably don't even know about that. Where it was listed alongside specific deadly addictive opioids, including heroin, recognized as having little to no therapeutic purposes. In 2020, the World Health Organization, the World Health Organization through the UN, 53 member states, the UN's central drug policy making body, voted to remove cannabis from that schedule. It was there for 59 years, which is under the strictest control measures that apply and basically makes it almost impossible to study the plant. So with a vote of 27 in favor and 25 against and one abstention, they opened the door to recognize the medicinal and therapeutic potential of the drug. But more than 50 countries have adopted medicinal cannabis programs, while Canada, Uruguay, and 15 U.S. states have legalized its recreational use, with Mexico and Luxembourg, which we covered, having political debates as to whether to follow the path. So Luxembourg has officially legalized cannabis. Mexico has done everything except enact legalization. They've passed it in the Congress, but they're just dragging their feet, waiting for something. I wonder what they're waiting for probably the consumer market to come online and America is the consumer market. You want better trade with your partners, cannabis and hemp, that's where it's at. You heard it here. Now this is going to be a very interesting development if it does move from schedule one to schedule three because there are things in state laws that automatically trigger and change upon the schedulization of cannabis, meaning the state laws will change automatically if it's federally rescheduled then people would have to potentially pass new laws in their state to catch up or to you know, 
piece together what we currently have as far as cannabis regulations. So what does a Schedule One drug currently mean? Current status as a Schedule One substance indicates a high potential for abuse with no accepted medical use, along with a lack of accepted safety for use under medical supervision. Yet that conflicts with many states' rules that allow the drug to be used recreationally and prescribed for treatment of everything from glaucoma to anxiety. So that statement is inherently inaccurate if you have medical programs for cannabis in the United States. I mean, think about that. If you're saying it has no medical benefits, yet 15 plus states have it as medically legal, how do you make that make sense? Something's wrong, something's off, there's a disconnect. So you have to be consistent and marry the two on a common ground. Moving the drug to Schedule 3 would be the most significant federal cannabis reform in modern history, but it should never have been scheduled alongside heroin in the first place. Thankfully, the era of the drug war is coming to a slow, very slow close uh, and being replaced by a modern and scientific approach by regulating a plant. And again, it's a plant put on the world, on the earth, by God himself, and humans don't have the right to say, we can't grow it at home. That's all. Now, I'm being hypercritical, but it is a big day for cannabis. This is a very good news, good day for cannabis. More people talking about cannabis, the better, especially talking about it in a positive, progressive, and I don't mean that political way, I mean progress in a progressive way. I mean, we're progressing towards something better. Some cannabis industry advocates said the recommendation of rescheduling doesn't go far enough and that it won't fix the clash between federal law and the 38 states that allow it for medical use and 23 states that allow it for recreational use. And like we said earlier, the move would do nothing to align federal law with the states. In an emailed statement, quote, the only way to fully resolve the myriad of issues stemming from the federal conflict with the state conflict is to remove cannabis from the Controlled Substances Act entirely and regulate the product in a manner similar to alcohol. I keep hearing everybody say, I want it to be treated the same as alcohol. Okay, what does that mean? People sell homebrew kits and brew at home, but now we you don't have to register anything with the government. You can just do that. But to grow at home or to work at a dispensary, you gotta register with the government. You don't have to register with the government to be a bartender. You just got to take a certification course, but they don't need your fingerprint. You can't advertise on a billboard anywhere for cannabis in a certain range, but you can do with alcohol. Does this mean cannabis companies will be able to sponsor college football games? Will they be able to run advertisements during the Super Bowl? There was during the Super Bowl last year, but it got cut. They didn't approve it for whatever reason. It's amazing. In an industry that just relies around money, such as advertising, they don't take the advertising money because of cannabis. Who they get a call from? That's my only question. Now, while a lot of things are not addressed in this recommendation, and they're not supposed to be, this is supposed to be only about the science and health and benefits of cannabis. It doesn't have anything to do with banking, interstate commerce, international commerce, social equity, licensing, testing, all of that is left out because that comes after this change, which hasn't even happened yet. This is a recommendation for the change. Then the change needs to happen. And then all that framework can be applied. So while it is something to celebrate, it's not the biggest win in the world, but it is the biggest news about cannabis in my lifetime. So that is something to celebrate. So we will talk to you next time after I go celebrate.